November the 12th, 1831. A conference of elders of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints met to discuss the revelations received by the prophet Joseph Smith up to that time. As a body, the conference, quote, voted that the revelations be prized by this conference to be of worth to the church, the riches of the whole earth, end of quote. President Ezra Taft Benson once said, quote, the Book of Mormon brings men to Christ. The Doctrine and Covenants brings men to Christ's kingdom, even the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The Book of Mormon and Doctrine and Covenants are bound together as revelations from Israel's God to gather and prepare his people for the second coming of the Lord." End of quote. I think the Doctrine and Covenants, um, unbeknownst to us, is a book of scripture that we have understudied in the Restoration. Not because we wanted to set it aside, but I think more often than not, you will hear um, the saints, students quoting from the Book of Mormon because we have emphasized it so much and for good reasons. You, we will quote from the Bible but for some reason, we are a, a little bit less versed in terms of what the Doctrine and Covenants is as a book of scripture. In the church, the Book of Mormon gets a lot of attention uh, and deservedly so. Um, so sometimes the question comes up, why do we need the Doctrine and Covenants? If the Book of Mormon is so crucial, what's the Doctrine and Covenants offering that the Book of Mormon's not? And it's important to see that the Book of Mormon, in my opinion, is the book of salvation. Meaning it's the book that brings you to, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Faith, repentance, baptism, the gift of the Holy Ghost. And it's the book that brings you to Christ. Whereas the Doctrine and Covenants, I like to call the book of exaltation. It's the book that will bring you to the uh, temple. But the Doctrine and Covenants then will start to teach you of the covenants of the Father and bring you to exaltation, which is why President Benson called the Book of Mormon is the keystone, but the Doctrine and Covenants is the capstone of our religion because it points you to the temple, which is the capstone of our ordinances and doctrine. But I find it fascinating, Joseph Fielding Smith has a, has a great statement where he says the following, in my judgment, there is no book on earth yet to get come to man as important as the book known as the Doctrine and Covenants. With all due respect to the Book of Mormon and the Bible and the Pearl of Great Price, which we say are our standards in the doctrine, the Book of the book of Doctrine and Covenants to us stands in a peculiar position above them all. But the reason why the Doctrine and Covenants is so important uh, for, for a variety of reasons is it, became, is it because it contains the Word of God for our dispensation for now. So, uh, of course, the coming forth of the Doctrine and Covenants, uh, I think anyone who studies the Doctrine and Covenants probably should know that that isn't its original title. Uh, the Doctrine and Covenants uh, was preceded by a book, uh, by a different title before it, called the Book of Commandments. So, uh, in 1831, uh, a group of elders gathered in Hiram, Ohio, to decide in a conference of the church uh, upon publishing the revelations that Joseph Smith had received to that point. And uh, the conference discussed, voted, and decided to publish Joseph Smith's revelations. Uh, and a preface was given by the Lord, uh, today known as Section 1 of the Doctrine of Covenants. And, uh, and the conference voted and decided to publish 10,000 copies of, that, uh, of, the, of the revelations in a book that would be called the Book of Commandments. Uh, they sent uh, uh, John Whitmer and Oliver Cowdery uh, to Missouri uh, to publish the revelations uh, at the hand of a, the church's printer, a man by the name of William W. Phelps. And so in 1833, that book started to take shape. Uh, the revelations were rolling off the press and, and coming towards uh, publication uh, when uh, mobs attacked the print shop and destroyed the press and in July of 1833 and, and effectively put an end to the publication of the Book of Commandments. And so uh, fast forward a, a couple of years to Kirtland and, and Joseph Smith wants uh, 
individuals to have access to the revelations. Uh, in the meantime, uh, they've held a, a, a series of theological lessons in a, in a school called the School of the Prophets. And those theological lessons, known as the uh, Lectures on Faith, uh, were designed uh, to be used by elders going out to preach the gospel. And so a decision was made to uh, publish the revelations that they had originally intended in the Book of Commandments, plus those that Joseph had received uh, after, their, uh, after the destruction of the press in Missouri, um, and the lectures on faith uh, into a new book to be called the Book of Doctrine and Covenants. Uh, the Doctrine and Covenants then rolled off the presses and was published in 1835 in Kirtland, and its name uh, harkens back to those two components of the book. If one opens an original Doctrine and Covenants, an 1835 edition, you'll notice that uh, um, the first part is called the Doctrine of the Church of the Latter-day Saints. That was the name of the church at the time. And, uh, and part second were, was called the Covenants or Commandments of the Lord. So they took those two parts, part one and part two, and made that the book, The Doctrine and Covenants of the Church of the Latter-day Saints. Number one, it's important to realize that the Doctrine and Covenants is comprised of a lot of different ways those revelations came. Some of them are God spoke to Joseph in his mind and then Joseph repeated it and a scribe wrote it down. That's the way most people picture the Doctrine and Covenants. Some of them are minutes from a meeting. Uh, some of them are letters that he wrote. Some of them are amalgamations of, of various things from the Book of Mormon, like Section 20, our Constitution. And in Section 1 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord says, I speak to men according to their own understanding and after the manner of their language. And so the revelations given to Jeremiah and the revelations given to John and the revelations given to Joseph Smith are all going to be a little bit different uh, based on their understanding and their language. And I think when we say understanding, I'm comfortable saying their cultural context, uh, the world that they grew up in, um, the, th the things and issues that they dealt with in their own time were all things that the Lord took into account uh, when he spoke. So the voice of the Lord uh, is slightly different from prophet to prophet, and that is the Lord adjusting to, to meet them where they're at uh, and help them where they stand. Uh, section one, where um, the Lord clearly tells us what a revelation is about and that the revelation is never dissociated from, again, this context and this culture of the prophet. But the Lord is saying that there are human beings like you and I, they, ha they have flaws, and yet I still choose them to speak to them, to tell them what is needed for the church and for the world. It's not a translation. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's of modern origin. And so, uh, as, as inspired as the other translations are, and I believe that they are inspired, especially the Book of Mormon, I think many of us would recognize something is always lost in translation. It's always moderated by the language of the person doing the translation. And, and um, the Doctrine and Covenants is, is different in that regard because it doesn't undergo a, a, a language translation. One thing I love about the title page on that uh, 1835 edition of the Doctrine and Covenants, it says, carefully selected from the revelations of God. Um, I think that's a signal to the reader. Uh, this book never was intended to contain every revelation of the prophet Joseph Smith. And, and, and that has remained true to this day. It doesn't contain every revelation of the prophet Joseph Smith or of all of his successors. It was always a careful selection uh, of the revelations of God given to his prophets. The Revelations and the Doctrine and Covenants um, did have changes made to them. Joseph Smith was not a human fax machine, is kind of what we say sometimes, and that sometimes he would go back and make choices, maybe this word was better than that word. And that does tend to show that the process of revelation isn't just words coming through someone, 
uh, the person's uh, personality and experiences are involved too. So understand that Joseph views it his prerogative as God's spokesperson to clarify what those words mean and to add to those words as God gives him more. And we should rejoice in that and uh, not lose faith in that. That's, a, that's an edifying idea to me. And this is a book where we see Jesus Christ speaking in first person, helping us become heirs to exaltation. And, and there's so much more. If you want to hear God's voice, some people think, and Elder Maxwell made this comment once, some people think they would turn to the New Testament. But in reality, it's the Doctrine of Covenants where you hear his voice on nearly every page. Um, I, I, I talk to my students about what a red letter Bible is. A, a red letter Bible, of course, being a Bible where the words of Jesus are in red. And if you open a red letter Bible in the New Testament, large portions of the New Testament aren't red letter. Large portions even of the Gospels aren't red letter. I've always wished someone would make a red letter Doctrine and Covenants, um, just to be able to see how much of that book really is the words of the Lord, um, as given through, through the prophet of the Restoration. Doctrine and Covenants, however, is um, specifically a book of scripture for this time and age. And so I'm hoping that whenever we are dealing with it, that we can take time to hear the voice of the Lord speaking in our time and age. One of the hard things about the Doctrine and Covenants is it has no storyline, as everybody knows. We love the Book of Mormon, we love the New Testament and the Old, because they have storylines that carry us, and we like story, we learn through story. So a three-step approach that I would recommend with the Doctrine and Covenants is number one, you have to go get the background and the context to every section. You've got to learn context. The reason why I say that is because without context, it's hard to figure out what's really happening and you and I will miss some of the intended teachings and the depths in, of the sections. The second thing to do is, I, I say, study for original intent. We, we like to read scriptures and say, what does that mean to you? And well, I think it means that we should, if I could give you any advice, please wait to do that. That's important, but that's step three. Step two is, instead of asking what does it mean to me, ask what would it have meant to them? So know the background and context. Ask yourself what was its original intent? What, was, what would it have meant to them in their time, their context? And then you'll get deeper meaning to do step three, which is to then say, okay, then what is it a meaning for me? Even if you, as much as we would love to know more, about Nephi or Mormon or Moroni, you're bound by the pages of that text. There's nowhere else to go. Um, that's not true in the Doctrine and Covenants. If I want to know more about Brigham Young, Wilford Woodruff, uh, Emma Smith, uh, Vienna Jakes, uh, uh, and any other number of Hiram Smith, um, uh, any other oh, Isaac Morley, I can go learn more. I can read their journals. Uh, I, many of my students, many of us have set foot where these revelations were given. That's a lot harder to do with, with other books of Scripture. Uh, to say this is exactly where this event occurred, I can do that for much of the Doctrine of Covenants. So while it lacks an internal historical uh, narrative, there's much more robust external historical information available for this book. And that's a great advantage. Our students are very, very smart and, uh, and very, very dedicated to the gospel, and I think they get it. But I think what they don't always appreciate is how special the Doctrine and Covenants is to them. Like I said, uh, a student reads through the scriptures, and when they get to the Doctrine and Covenants, all of a sudden they have to step into the narrative. This isn't the story of an ancient civilization. So it's not the first book we hand to people when we, when we knock on their door, uh, but it definitely is vital. Uh, for us to understand the world we live in and, and the situations that we face.
But we have to get to know the Doctrine and Covenants because Joseph Smith said that uh, the revelations of the Doctrine and Covenants are the foundation of the church in these last days. If we don't know the Doctrine and Covenants, we won't really know and understand how this church operates, how it functions, uh, not just in the mechanics of administration, which is part of it, but also in its revelatory procedures, its doctrine, uh, its ordinances and emphasis. It, it's the foundation of the church. Generally, when I um, teach the Doctrine and Covenants, I, I st at the first, first time, first week, I like to tell the students that Doctrine and Covenants has, you know, invitation for people to have faith and to repent. And it is also, in a sense, a canonized book, uh, handbook of instructions. Uh, instructions on how to perform baptism, instructions on how to, uh, to do the sacrament, in instructions on um, when, how, what, what a quorum is. But we would be lost without the Doctrine and Covenants, with that text to give us um, not only additional uh, policies, programs, procedures. Here's how you sustain people with priesthood office. Here's what different priesthood offices do. Here's the purpose of the sacrament. Here's, you, it doesn't matter what you take for the sacrament. Um, here's, here's what, uh, um, here's why marriage matters. These are all things that without the Doctrine and Covenants, uh, we would be lost. They give us the basic doctrinal purposes, the programs, the procedures for the church to build on and modern prophets today to continue to guide and reveal and, and lead on. But we'd be, lost, we'd be lost without the Doctrine and Covenants for those things. In 2010, we began the production of church history television shows. Season one, Foundations of the Restoration. Season two, Joseph Smith Kirtland. Season three, Pentecost to Persecution. And season four, Nauvoo, the City Beautiful. And after that, three more seasons telling the story of Brigham Young and the Saints. Altogether, more than 100 hours and seven seasons of fascinating church history. Available at historyofthesaints.org or at Deseret Book. The Doctrine and Covenants is our open canon of Scripture. It's the canon of Scripture that gets modified um, authoritatively by prophets. Um, I, I tell my students that uh, um, uh, the Doctrine and Covenants has been modified a number of times by prophets of God. And so it's the open canon of Scripture that prophets, as they receive revelation, um, can add to it, or as they feel inspired to add previous revelations that their predecessors may have received, uh, can be added to it. The Old Testament, New Testament, and Book of Mormon all say the end on the last page. The Doctrine and Covenants does not say that. Um, you could write to be continued down at the bottom because uh, it's, it's a foregone conclusion that there will be additions to the Doctrine and Covenants. But don't be surprised if that might happen in the future. There are yet foundational doctrinal and covenantal ideas and revelations, many great and important things that can come and still be added to that book. You and I really want to come to know the voice of the Lord. We should read the Doctrine and Covenants because it's spoken so directly, first person, plainly in there. What's interesting is when Joseph in the early church publishes the Doctrine and Covenants, Joseph says, search the revelations that we publish. He's speaking of the Doctrine and Covenants. And then listen to what he says, and ask God in the name of his Son to manifest the truth of it unto you. And if you do so with real intent, having faith in Christ, he will manifest the truth of it unto you. Joseph then says, you will know for yourself and not for another. That language echoes Moroni's language at the end of the Book of Mormon, but this is Joseph issuing this promise for his book of revelations that came directly from him. The Doctrine and Covenants for me is a 
number of revelations given from the Lord to his prophets on the earth today to help both women and men come into Christ, receive the power that is, uh, that is available to them, the authority available to them, through priesthood ordinance and through and through revelation from the Lord in that context, but also it is a guidance of how to receive our temple endowment. It's guidance in how to receive uh, our our spiritual blessings, and so the the doctrine and covenants guides us through this this process of literally becoming like Him. Uh, as as we have heavenly parents, He is helping us to understand doctrinally how we can become. Uh, our, we can become heavenly parents and receive our exaltation as he has. President Ezra Taft Benson said in April 1987, God bless us to use all the scriptures, but in particular, the instrument he has designed to bring us to Christ, the Book of Mormon, the keystone of our religion, along with its companion volume, the capstone, the Doctrine and Covenants, the instrument he designed to bring us to Christ's kingdom, even the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He also said, by way of eternal perspective, the bringing forth of these sacred volumes of scripture cost the best blood of the 19th century, that of Joseph and Hiram Smith, end of quote. And lastly, also speaking of the Doctrine and Covenants, in 1978, Elder Neil A. Maxwell said, the majesty and power of the Lord are so evident. The prayerful reader of this disclosing divine volume of scripture will enlarge his testimony and draw even closer to the Savior than he has ever been before." End of quote.